Mm. All right, we are officially mm. live now, and they're going to be coming in. Man, hey, Casey, are you going to be moaning all all hour about those? Mm. Cookies? Depends how many cookies he's going to have, mm. and if he goes mm. to the limit, I'm sure there's no moan with the limit mm. one. Good in my belly. <laughs> no milk. Mm. No energy drink. Oh. For those of you just t- tuning in, it's Girl Scout cookie season. That's what's going on right here in the Marquee household. <laughs> Not candy corn related, Heather, <laughs> but great guess. Samoas. Mm-hmm. Mm. <laughs> Hi, Amy. Hi, everyone. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. While you're all tuning in, let us know where you're tuning in from. We're so excited to get back to SEO for Publishers in this new year. Paula from Ooh. Buenos Aires again. Mm, good, we got a good, got a good. Amy again. Hi, Amy. How are you doing? We actually have our first. We have our first official question from Julie. Hi, Julie. Um, what is your favorite Girl Scout cookie, Casey? Great question. Look, I don't discriminate. They're all my favorite, but uh, if I had to choose just one, it'd be the tagalongs. So, and I don't have any of those right now because I eat them all. All I have. <laughs> have you put are those my... in the fridge? Uh, you know, my wife likes all of her cookies cold. Mm. You know, it's fine. I, I don't. I just like cookies. Period. Hot, cold, <laughs> left on a radiator, left out. Doesn't matter. Good times. Uh, I, for me, it's thin mints in the freezer. No question. No, Sorry, no, 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 that makes uh, sense. If you're gonna put them in the freezer for thin mints, Samoas then, like, are really I'll good. have one. And and they have coconut in them, so they have to be healthy. That's why I like. Oh at yeah, them. yeah. High in fiber. You're good. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Great logic. <laughs> wow, we have people from all mm-hmm. over. Did you Greenland. See mm. Harrison from Nigeria. Wow. Oh. Wow. Hi, Harrison. Lots of snowy places. My pipes froze for the first time living in this is my first real winter. And so I got <laughs> to experience that. So oh. all you living in snow. Fun times. <laughs> I do not miss that at all. Mm. <sighs> Born and raised in Kansas, we used to have the frozen pipes all the time. Nope. Yep. Had to go throw a heater down the well. <laughs> wow. Pipes are good now. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. All right. I think everybody's just about poured in. So mm-hmm. we are going to get uh, started with the seventh episode. Happy New Year again, everybody, and welcome to our first episode of 2021 of SEO for Publishers with our expert panelists, Casey Marquis and Andrew Wilder. We're down one arson today, but don't worry, we plan to switch things up and we have a lot of technical content today. So as always, feel free to head over to the Q&A box definitely drop your questions. We're going to try and answer as many as we can. Anything that we don't get to, we will be addressing afterwards. Um, This recording will, or this presentation will be recorded. We'll put it up on YouTube as well as a recap blog post. So you'll get the transcript, the video, and all of the questions in Q&A answered. So definitely don't worry, but by all means, as you get questions, make sure you put them over to the Q&A. That way we ensure they get answered 100%. So how we're going to do things today a little bit differently, we're first going to dive into a little bit of some stuff that happened in 2020, and then we're going to go into how we can prepare for uh, Q1 of 2021. So Casey, let's get started with some questions for you. Uh, Let's go back to 2020 for just a quick second. I know everyone who's attending, just brace yourself, so let's go back. You're you're blocking that from your memory. I get it. (laughs) 2020 does not exist. We, we do not speak of it anymore. I know, I know. We, zero, we zero. The grave. No stars would not recommend. Totally get it, guys. No, no, totally definitely it. not. But for a, a hot second, let's go back into the last month of 2020. And Casey, can you kind of remind us what happened on December 4th with the core update from Google? Absolutely. So many of you might be aware that Google launches these core updates, which are the only announced updates that they really do these days. And they offer, they, they launch them very infrequently. We had a core update in January of 2020. We had a core update in May of 2020. And then we had another core update, the last one for the year in December 4th, 2020. Now this core update 
didn't complete until 1216, which was kind of interesting because we had a big movement of issues on around 12.9 and 12.10. There was a lot of volatility. I had a lot of bloggers reach out and says, oh my gosh, seems like I was doing okay on the 4th. And then the 9th and 10th came along and they had all this volatility. What happened? And it's usually pretty common. Google is Google is going in, they're pushing out and increased signals. They're looking at the data. Maybe they're making some changes. Clearly, if you've had losses, that doesn't help you though. So I know it's, it's discouraging for some people. But with these core updates, this is again, Google trying to improve the quality overall of the search results. Now, I know that a lot of people are confused by these core updates and you're like, oh my gosh, it seemed like I was doing everything right, blah, blah, blah. And then all of a sudden I got hit by this core update and now I've lost like, you know, 20% of my traffic, 15% of my traffic. Now, I know it's, it's frustrating. Now, Google will come out and say, well, in many cases, you might not have been doing anything else wrong. Someone else was doing things better. Of course, <laughs> that's, that's not comforting for a lot of you. But if you've been affected by one of these core updates, basically the bottom line is, is that Google has reevaluated quality signals on your site. And these quality signals can look like anything. It's never just one thing. Uh, core updates are very aggregated in nature. It's a matter of improving bottom line quality. It's a matter of improving or removing aggressive ads. It's a matter of addressing thin or low quality content, fixing, uh, modifying slow page speed, making sure that we improve anything that's user specific or user metric related on your site. Now, John Mueller recently explained, especially for positive changes that let's say you had been affected by a previous update and you'd only made recent changes on your site in the last two to three weeks. And you're like, Casey, I don't understand. I just had an audit in maybe, maybe October. And I'm, you know, and I was expecting to get recovery from the update in May or in December. In many cases, that's unfortunately not enough time. Google usually says that in many cases, if you've made any changes from two to four weeks in advance, that's not really enough time to be reflected in the update. And that can be very confusing to users. Core, but in many cases, we really want to focus on the long term. This is a relevancy adjustment. We want to make sure that we're looking at our site anew, that we're trying to do everything we can to get this fine tuning in order. Okay. So when we're looking at what you as a site owner can do specifically to recover from these core updates, I want you to do a couple of things specifically. Number one, and most importantly, I want you to start taking a hard look at your content and make sure that it's satisfying the user intent of the search query. Look at the query, look at how it's written, look at what's being returned in Google. One of the examples that I saw from a blogger who reached out is that she had incorrectly been using how to schema on a lot of posts when the query and the relevancy of those posts were using recipe schema. A lot of people make that mistake. These are not interchangeable. For those of you on the call who are confused by this, how to schema should never be used on food and drinks. If it's edible, we always use recipe schema. And so in her case, that was one of the things that really stood out immediately is that whereas she was losing traffic and rankings on very specific posts, when we would go into Google and look at everything else that was ranking, it was recipe scheme. It wasn't how to. So in that case, I think if we switch all of her how to to recipe schema correctly, she might get some improvement. We also want to, of course, number two, fix all your technical issues. We really want to go in, we run a run a technical crawl. We want to make sure all your broken links are fixed. There's plugins like the broken link checker. I might have Fandrews free to, to paste that in. It's very, it's a great plugin. We use it all the time. We want to go in and fix 404s. We want to go in and fix 503s. We want to go in and make sure that we've done everything we can on that side to correct things. We want to look at the your site and your recipes specifically in the Google structured data testing tool. We want to fix all errors specifically. We want to try to fix as many schema warnings as we can. Bottom line quality, doing little things like that. We want to look at internal linking. We want to make sure, most importantly, brings us to number three, you want to look at your ads. Aggressive ad practices are one of the biggest reasons sites have been negatively impacted by these core updates. How many ads are you running? Are you running video or auto playing ads? Do these ads follow the user down the screen? Are you, for example, jumping your users from the top of the post to another ad instead of saying, hey, here's a jump to recipe button, but instead of jumping them to the recipe, you jump them to another ad, okay? Those kind of things, especially again, if you were affected algorithmically are things that I would look at changing. We wanna focus on giving you the better, the best bottom line quality we can for those recipes. Now, 
one of the other things that is a lot harder for bloggers to understand is the concept of EAT. And when we talk about EAT, EAT, expertise, authoritativeness, and trustworthiness, it's, it's not an algorithm. It's a strategy. You know, when we talk about expertise, we're talking about showing clear knowledge, answering the right user intent, expressing clear usability in our content. That's what expertise is. Then we go to the second one, which is authoritativeness. When we're talking about authoritativeness, we're talking about being cited by others. We're talking about only being linked to by others. We're talking about being featured by other authors. You know, if you have the ability to, to be interviewed, if you have the ability to participate in a podcast, do maybe guest blogging or guest posting on other larger sites, that can really bottom line help you with regards to your overall EAT. And then we get, of course, to the trustworthiness. And then when we talk about trustworthiness, security goes hand in hand with authoritativeness. So if you are cited and linked to, you're trusted. And that's where I see a lot of bloggers struggle with is they just, God, this backlink building is so tough, or I just don't know what I need to do to increase my EAT. And it's, it's just a lot of little things, just like we just quickly discussed here. Now, one of the other things is, and this goes hand in hand with the ENT, is the backlinks and the boosting of site authority. A lot of bloggers come to me and they're like, Casey, I don't understand what I'm doing. I just qualified for MediaMind. I really worked hard on my 50,000 sessions. It's been two years and I haven't been able to build my traffic. Well, because when you add ads to your site, you're going to immediately make it harder to build traffic. That's the bottom line truth. And so you have to work harder than a lot of other sites once you've done that, once you've monetized, because you've dynamically changed the technical and the speed setup of your site. So we wanna go in and we wanna make sure, hey, what other technical issues can we fix? When I have an audit, I usually do three areas. We're looking at the technical issues, that'd be leg number one. We're looking at the content issues, leg number two. And then we're looking at leg number three, which are the offside factors, things like EAT, things like your backlink profile, things like the size of your email list. All those are gonna go hand in hand to improve the bottom line quality of your site. And the goal is to make as many of these changes as we can. It's basically called the kitchen sink approach. Our goal is to fix as much as we can between core updates so that Google can crawl and reevaluate our content whenever they can. And that's what we have to work on. So for those of you on the call who are confused by this, we previously did a webinar and you'll have to help me out here, Ashley. It was a a little while ago, and it might have been one of our first ones. And we talked about core updates in detail. I think it might have been the very first one that we did. And we talked a little bit about what Google's looking for. And Google's advice on core updates is honestly not super helpful. But nevertheless, it is something that you should educate yourself on and read. I'm going to paste in that link here specifically. And you want to go through that when you can. But when we're talking about improving between core updates, don't get frustrated. That's the worst thing you can do. They're People recover from this stuff all the time, but it's hard to do it on your own. Go ahead and seek out help. Consider investing in an audit. Consider going into the food blogger groups and getting some help there, having some people go in and review some issues that might be affecting you. But we want to bottom line, make your site the best it can be because it's an extremely competitive niche out there. And it is never just one thing, folks. And Casey, one of the things you mentioned when you were talking about EAT and trying to get backlinks and how complicated that could be, uh, would another option be to kind of do like uh, blog collaborations, like recipe collaborations? Lots of times when we think of backlinks, we think of earning them, but you mm -hmm. can also collaborate with fellow bloggers. Would you say there's any risk to that from a competitive nature when it comes to backlinks or would something like that still be strong from a link standpoint? Well, I think that anything can help as long as it's not done aggressively. Mm -hmm. So in your case, anything that's reciprocal in nature, a you link to me and I'll link to you, especially if it's a three way mm -hmm. and set yourself up for issues. For example, uh, the November unannounced update that we had in 2019. And then again, in January, 2020, when we had the announced core update, there was a ton of linking practices that came out of those updates that negatively impacted bloggers. They had been really trading links at scale between the small mm -hmm. same group of bloggers and we just don't want to do that. Mm -hmm. So if you're thinking things like blog hops are going to help you, the answer is no. If you're thinking of like these, we used to do these, these themed link parties where you had things like meatless Mondays and uh, what's another one, Sunday supper, things like that. Mm -hmm. They had their place when they had their time and that time has passed. We just don't do any of that stuff anymore because it's a concerted effort 
to trade links and we just we don't need to do that so your goal is really to make your site linkable if you have the ability to link to something that's related feel free we want to link out i think where a lot of bloggers get confused is that linking out is bad and i see more and more bloggers are trying to no follow all of their outgoing links that's one of the worst things that you can absolutely do because you're taking you're you're literally putting a black hole in the link scheme in the linkscape there mm -hmm. makes it very harder for google to understand what you're doing we don't know follow all of our outgoing links. We only know follow a link that is affiliate or advertorial in nature, that's sponsored, or that you just do not trust. Okay. So whenever you hear someone say, hey, you should know follow all of your social media links, do you not trust your own Instagram page? Do you not trust your own Facebook page? There's no value in that. Anyone who tells you to do that probably believes in a concept called page break sculpting. And that has been, that's like, uh, been useless for at least a decade. So don't do that stuff. Yeah, that makes sense. And it is as far as Google updates, a lot happened last year, but there was another update that Google recently mm -hmm. put out live, which was Google passage based indexing. Can you kind of explain what that is and how it's a ranking factor and not so much an indexing change, even though the name suggests it, suggests it. it's kind of confusing there. Passage indexing is really interesting, and it's going to be very beneficial for most of you on the call specifically. To, instead of making multiple articles about different topics, a subtopic found in a longer and broader page can now, be, can now be used as a factor to help improve your rankings for a particular query. Basically, like, let's say Google, Google's basically saying it's making our job easier. We can help find a needle in a haystack quite a bit easier. Well, what does that mean? Well, the passages themselves are not ranking factors, but passage indexing was initially going to be referred to as passage ranking. That's how close it was to what they were trying to do. But all this change does is it exists to help longer web pages rank better by making it easier for Google to go down and pull out the most appropriate passages within the longer post based upon the intent of the query in nature. A lot of you have been told throughout the years that you need to have these really long blog posts when we've known for, again, years that word count is not a ranking factor. This has annoyed Google so much that they've started to really come back with these things like passage indexing to make it easier to go through this content and find kind of the meat among all the other spam that's on the page, so to speak, pulling out using another analogy, they'd be literally pulling out the flowers surrounded in a field of weeds. And that's what they're doing with this passage indexing. And that's good news for a lot of recipe and lifestyle bloggers who still write a lot of these convoluted long posts with superfluous information. Um, it's gonna help it make it easier for Google to pull out the information that they're in. Now, Google will tell you that there's no way to optimize for this. And that's good. They want to make it as simple as possible. But for those of you on the call who are like, okay, you know, I want to make my pages as user friendly as possible. What can I do to maybe provide a little bit more guidance, maybe a, some kind of a, a headline or a signpost per se, that would make it easier for Google to find my most important information. And to do that, you use jump links. And I know jump links are something that we've talked about repeatedly on some of these other webinars. If you have a Feast theme, Feast has these built-in jump links. I'm going to go ahead and paste over a link to that. They're called Advanced Jump To Links. I do recommend you use these. They're great. Feast jump links. And if you're not on a Feast theme, that's totally okay. I recommend the use of the Lucky WP plugin. It is a table of contents plugin. It's fantastic. I'm going to paste that information over here. I'm going to put two bloggers on the spot. I'm going to put Marie at Restless Chipotle, and I'm going to put Darren over at Running on Real Food. I think they might be on the call. They might not, but they do a very good job utilizing these individual plugins. And if you want to see these in action, take a look at the examples that I'm pasting over. It is so easy to do. These, these um, jump menus, especially with WP, uh, Lucky WP, it's just based on the headings on the page. Now, I recommend that you just use H2 headings. A lot of people do use H3s and H4s, but there is so much thing. There is there is a thing as too much detail. So I don't necessarily need to have a big jump menu with, with H3s and H4s. H2s are just fine. And you can make it so that the default 
is that this jump menu is collapsible and that's totally fine. Some people like to show the whole jump menu at the top of the page. And by top of the page, I would recommend below the first featured image of the page, preferably. We've got some teaser text above the fold. We've got a nice featured image. Then we've got this jump menu that we can take advantage of. You can collapse it, it works very well. And again, you've got multiple benefits for using these jump links. Number one, you will generate jump links in Google. I see it all the time, okay? So if someone is doing a search, you can get, and if you're, especially on the home page, especially on the front page, you'll get a listing and it'll have multiple individual jump indent links below your listing, below the featured image and below the meta description. And those jump links can take you to different places on the page. Very user-friendly. And I think that's gonna help, especially with regards to passage indexing. So check that out and um, keep doing what you're doing, but do it smarter. And we have a big update coming in May. So you've addressed two updates that are already released and some tactics and, and things to start fixing on sites. But for the big update coming in May, the page experience algorithm, Casey, how prepared do we need to be for that? Are there any major changes other than a lot of the items that you just addressed that publishers need to start focusing on? And I know, Andrew, you're going to be touching on this shortly, but um, Casey, do you have any input there? Yeah, I'm going to very briefly cover this because I know Andrew's got a lot of cool stuff to talk about this, but this core, this, this page experience algorithm will go live in May. And it's been told that this is going to be very similar to the kind of tiebreaker algorithms we've had in the past, things like the HTTPS ranking boost, things like being mobile friendly, things like uh, uh, the other one was the mobile interstitial uh, penalty. You know, if, if you are very close competitively with another site and you're competing for the same bucket or basket of queries and you have very close metrics, if they have better core web vitals, if they have better page experience algorithm metrics than you do, it's very possible they can win that tiebreaker. And that's why this is very important. Andrew's going to go over these, but these this page experience algorithm is a reflection. It's made up of seven individual metrics. It's made up of three core web vitals, largest contentful paint, first input delay, and cumulative layout shift, or CLS. By far, the hardest one to optimize for is CLS, and we're going to spend some time on that today. And then it, we have four other metrics that have been around forever. And they've all, you know, we, we, it's something that we individually talk about in the audits. It's something that every blog or site owner should know about. And those four individual metrics are mobile friendliness, uh, safe browsing, making sure that you don't have any spam issues against your site. We have a safe browsing tab in Google Search Console, so we can check that. HTTPS, making sure that your site is secured and you've converted to SSL, you've converted to HTTPS. It doesn't happen as much as it does as it does previously, but I still run across a blocker onboarding for an audit and they have not moved to SSL. <laughs> They're usually with Bluehost, so it's linked. We also have the last of those four metrics and that's intrusive interstitial guidelines. This is a big one. I know a lot of you bloggers struggle with pop-ups. I am really against most pop-ups. Uh, if you have anything on your site that engages on the first click from Google, that's a concern. So you have to ask yourself, are you willing to accept that this is a violation? A lot of people are confused by how the interstitial um, penalty works. Mm -hmm. But interstitials are very easy. If it engages on the first click from Google, it really needs to be incredibly small, like one third the size of the page, okay? Are you there any tools to use to, to kind of run through to make sure that it is one third of the page or how, how can you know that you're meeting those it's, guidelines? It's more, it's more visual. I mean, especially okay. if you pull out your phone and if I pull out your phone and I click over to a, a page from Google and I'm, a, I'm immediately confronted with a, a pop-up that I have to close, that hurts you. And a lot of bloggers think, mm -hmm. well, you know, I've got to get those pop-ups. One of the things you might want to consider is a is just a small strip that you use on the top of the page or something like that, that will allow you to passively collect these emails. But the better option is to use what are called exit only pop-ups. These pop-ups only enable after you're leaving the page or when you start navigating between pages. Mm -hmm. That's when we talk about exit only intent. And I know it's confusing because we have people pushing pop-up products 
but only a very few of them understand how to do it correctly. One of them that does it extremely well is Milo Tree. Milo Tree, I was very fortunate to, to visit with their founders a uh, earlier this month. They have a, I know there's an interview there going live in a couple of weeks and they do extremely well. They, they really only do exit only and they make it so that their pop-ups are only seen by one person as they're navigating through your site. Nothing is more annoying to me than to go through a site and have a pop-up sent to me on every page. It's the worst. <laughs> and you need to understand that on the call, guys. You're not doing this. Most of you have to go in and specifically get this fixed. You should only allow the one person during one session to see that pop-up. We shouldn't be giving them, I shouldn't be closing a pop-up on every page I navigate your site, whether that's desktop or mobile. Mm -hmm. So we really want to focus on the user experience. That's a big one, that intrusive interstitial thing. So be aware of that. And I guess the final thing I would say here is that, and, and this is also important, a good page experience doesn't override at all relevant high quality content. So mm -hmm. in some existences where, this is again, basically directly from Google's John Muir, in cases where there are multiple pages that have similar content, page experience becomes much more important for visibility in search, okay? So if the pages are really close together, just what we talked about, tiebreaker. But if the pages are not close together and one page has terrible core web vitals or terrible page experience metrics, but it is by far the better content, Google's still going to serve that page. So this isn't an all or anything um, situation. Still have to have the best of both. <laughs> exactly. And I know it's tough to see, but we're in an incredibly competitive niche here. So for those in the call, they're trying to build traffic. For those of you... I'm going to use vegan bloggers, gluten-free bloggers specifically because that's incredibly competitive sub-niches of recipe blogging in general. Those bloggers that are able to, co to, to, to cross the T's and dot the I's as much as possible with the concepts that we're covering today are the ones that are going to have a very, very happy 2021. In, in Google's article announcing the page experience algorithm, which it, we'll put a link to here, they talked again about AMP. And earlier, Casey talked about AMP. Um, Google specifically said in this article how they continue to support AMP content in Google search, basically uh -huh. hinting that they're going to prioritize it. So if publishers haven't already, what's the importance of installing the AMP plugin and start creating AMP content? Where, where do you stand with that? This is, this is very important. So if we don't, if you guys don't remember anything else today, remember this, you do not need to be using AMP at all, period. Do not even think of installing the AMP plugin. AMP pages do not monetize. AMP pages are something that Google has really dialed back specifically because what happened, and there's a whole article on this and I'll, I'll try to find the article and reach to it. Congress got involved when Google came out and said that AMP pages might be treated higher in search. Well, Congress came in and says, well, hey, not everyone can do AMP, so you can't really do that. And then Google kind of backtracked and says, oh, you're right. We're, we're going to say, you know, we, we like you to use AMP, but we're not going to give you any super huge benefits to do this. And that's very, it's very important for you to understand that. AMP is not a ranking factor. AMP has never been a ranking factor. AMP pages have a hard time monetizing. That's why Google came out with these core web vitals is because it's easy for you now to optimize a regular non-AMP page to be as fast or competitive as using the AMP framework. Matter of fact, uh, plenty of examples where we have non-AMP pages that are substantially faster than an AMP story, as an example. Now let's talk about where AMP should be used, and that's in web stories. And I know many of you are familiar with that, and we're gonna to touch upon web stories today, hopefully as well. AMP is very important for those, but you don't, you don't have to install a plugin. That's just the web stories. You have the web stories AMP, you're using AMP, but only on the web stories. And that's fine. That's what I recommend. You want to use the web stories. They're powered by AMP. That's great. There's a web stories carousel. You will get benefit from that. But don't think that one allows you to do the other. We would never, for example, want you to start using AMP for all of your recipe and other non-recipe and other non-web story content because there is literally no SEO benefit to doing that mm -hmm. at all. Yep. Hundred percent. All right. Well, let's switch gears over to you, Andrew. Casey, thank you. That was so, so much in depth and absolutely incredible. Um, Andrew, Casey talked a little bit about some of the metrics when it comes to core web vitals, but can you share where you can discover if you have any errors or if you're missing the mark on some of the metrics? Are there any tools out there? Is it in Google search console? What do you do? 
Sure. So there are actually a number of really good tools. Um, so just to reiterate, the, the stuff we're really looking at and talking about the most right now that's happening basically with the change coming in May is uh, the three new metrics that will become a ranking factor. That's largest content full paint, first input delay, and cumulative layout shift. So you're not going to be able to tell what these things are by just loading up a page and looking at them. So you need to use a testing tool to actually like get the actual numbers. So like largest contentful paint, you want that to be under like two to 2.2 seconds, for example, mm. like that's considered good. So the largest contentful paint, what that is, is just the biggest thing on the screen when you load it before you scroll on a mobile device. So if you're, um, if you have a really long post title that spans across three rows, that might be the largest content we'll paint for that page. If you have a really big picture that's above the fold, that could be the LCP. Um, so uh, it may depend on the specific page you're loading um, and your theme will determine the layout and the spacing of stuff like that. Uh, first input delay is all about interactivity. You want the site to actually work once it's loaded so someone can start scrolling or clicking on things. And then cumulative layout shift is you want to avoid stuff moving around as it loads. Um, Cause it's really annoying if you like stuff loads and then you go to click on something and something else loads in its place and, and shifts down and you click on the wrong thing. Um, as a side note, Google still does this in the search results and it drives me crazy. Um, on desktop at least, um, there are times where I'll search for things and immediately um, I'm about to click on like the second search result and immediately below the first result, it, it pops up with a little box that says like some other popular searches and I end up clicking on that by accident. So um, this is one of those cases where Google is do as I say, not as I do for sure. <laughs> uh, so to your question of how you can test this stuff, my go-to is the Google PageSpeed Insights testing tool. Um, and I'll drop a link in here. I mean, I'm guessing most of you are familiar with this tool already. Um, I figure why not go to the source? Um, you know, this is the official tool that Google provides. Um, now there are other testing tools out there. Uh, webpagetest.org is another great one. And I actually haven't tinkered with it yet, but GT Metrics just recently revamped their testing tool to start using uh, what's called Lighthouse. Basically the under, mm -hmm. underlying testing tool within this is called Lighthouse. Um, it's actually built into the Chrome web browser in the developer tools section. So you can even run this on your own site. Um, but from a user friendly perspective, um, just use Google PageSpeed Insights. It's the simplest way to, um, to get the numbers. Okay. And we, we've seen a lot and heard a lot really from publishers that they'll log in and they'll see completely different scores from or metrics from what's in Google Search Console and GPSI. Why does that happen and which scores should they really pay attention to or which metrics should they really pay attention to in both of those? Well, all of them. <laughs> But all of the uh, above, of course, all of the above, of course, but it's helpful to know which ones are really measuring which things. So mm -hmm. um, in PageSpeed Insights, when you run a test on a given page um, at the top, it'll show you what's called the, uh, the field data. So the field data is real world user data. It comes from the Chrome user experience report, which is actually people using the Chrome browser all over the web and it's sending back timings. So it's actually the real world times. Um, if a page has enough traffic, it'll show you the field data just for that page. Um, and it'll below that show you the, what's called the origin data, which is basically the average across all URLs on your site. Um, so that can give you a really good idea of what your site's act, how it's actually really performing in, in the real world. Um, and then below that, you'll see the lab data section. And the lab data is uh, when you ran that, when you put your URL in at, and it ran that test in that moment, it's a simulated test that gives you those re results. So it's a, a way to try to standardize it so you can actually run a test and tweak things and keep evaluating. So you don't have to wait for all that Chrome user experience data to come back in. Um, so the lab data is not real world, but it's close. Um, and I'll give you an example of where things can vary. Um, we, in our experience, it looks like the lab data for cumulative layout shift only looks at above the fold on GPSI, but the user experience report looks at cumulative layout shifts for the entire page as the user scrolls around. So that's why we're seeing really big discrepancies between those two numbers, especially. Um, mm. And you mentioned Google Search Console. Uh, mm -hmm. In Google Search Console, it's using the same user experience report. So the, the stuff that's showing up in the, um, the, the field data should be about the same as the Google Search Console data. It's basically Google's main database of how your site performs. Um, one thing to be aware of with Google Search Console, and I think I mentioned this um, in our last session, we were talking about this stuff in depth. Um, it, the, the user experience report is a 28 day rolling basis, right? So it's not just today's stats. So if you make a change and really improve things, you're not gonna see a result in the data significantly for about a month. Um, you might see it, you know, if it's significant enough, it might skew the average mm -hmm. better, but 
And so if you say improve your site, um, you want to make sure all your improvements are done for speed and then validate fixes in your search console and wait 28 days, um, which is all the more reason to start now because May is you know a few months out, so you still have time to keep testing stuff. Um, but you really want to fix the things and then then click on validate. And you don't, every time you click validate fixes in uh, Search Console for um, at least for the Core Web Vitals stuff, um, that restarts the 28 day clock. So you don't want to be like going in there every day and being like it didn't validate and trying again every day. <laughs> um, so uh, so in terms of which scores to pay attention to, it's really all of them. But it 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 depends what you're doing at that moment, right? Mm -hmm. If you're actually actively fixing a site, like we we often load up a site, we install WP Rocket, we're tweaking th things and we're testing. So we'll make some changes and then retest. And so mm -hmm. it doesn't do us any good to look at the field data there. We have to look at the lab data. And then based in experience, we go, okay, we've got the lab data good enough. Now we're gonna validate fixes and make sure in the real world, it actually applies that way. And does the lab data, is, is that kind of simulating what your normal user demographic would be? So it, it's supposed to be as if, you had a month's worth of traffic, you're able to see it within a day? Um, I'm trying to remember, it's, I think they're still simulating a 3G connection. Um, okay. So, you know, it's helpful to kind of simulate a slower connection because you can see a more nuanced difference. If you've got a crazy fast internet connection and a really fast processor on your mobile phone, things are gonna load faster. So you can't, like, you won't see that nuance. So it, it the simulation slows it down a little bit too. Um, keep in mind that the Chrome user experience report is global data. Um, mm -hmm. So if you've got users in, you know, more remote locations or who are on, on slower cell phone networks, you know, not mm -hmm. on 4G or 5G, but they're on 3G, that's going to affect your data, to, your scores too. Okay, that, that's definitely something good to consider. So say you, you, you go in, you see the metrics, you see that there's errors and you're trying to fix them. How badly do you think that the that the core web vital metrics, if you don't meet all of them and if you don't check all of the boxes, are you just going to lose traffic right away as soon as May hits, or is this kind of going to be a gradual thing? How how scared and how how scared should publishers be, and how fast should they start trying to make changes? So, um, I mean, first we don't know yet how big of an impact this change is going to happen be in May. I mean, Casey was talking about it a bit in, and I, I, I agree with mm -hmm. him. I don't think it's likely to be a massive impact. Um, okay. you know, the content is still the most important thing, right? User mm -hmm. search query intent, answer the question, give, provide great content. If you do that, you're going to be great. Um, so this is probably going to be more of a tiebreaker or a slight ranking factor. You know, there's hundreds of signals here and this is just one more, but everything adds up, right? So, you know, if, if this is such a competitive space, you want to make sure your recipes perform better or whatever you're writing about. So why not do, do your, um, you make it as fast as you can. Also, it's not just about SEO. It's actually about user experience, right? If your site is fast, your, your users will like it more. They'll, they'll spend more time on the site. They'll actually wait for the site to load, you know, so they'll actually see your content. Um, and then with the cumulative layout shift, that's more about annoying uh, visitors. Um, I will say, um, Ads are the biggest culprit here, particularly as people are scrolling. Um, so, uh, you know, as ads pop into place and if they shift content down, that's really obnoxious for a, a reader, right? So that's Very. that's the kind of thing when we're talking about, um, you know, so things can be implemented um, gracefully or they can be like, um, you know, a kind of a bludgeon your, your audience, right? So you wanna make sure you're, you're you know, you're gonna have to serve ads if you wanna make money, but you wanna make sure they're implemented um, gracefully. Okay, and are there, it, both you and Casey have mentioned a variety of different tools, but when it comes to trying to make some of these fixes and definitely prepare for May, are there any tools that you use in your database that you absolutely love or that you would recommend for publishers when they're trying to optimize both their site speed, their content, their user experience? Um, so in terms of like actually fixing the problems rather than testing the problems, um, our first tool is WP Rocket. Um, we include that on all of our support plans. Um, it's a premium plugin that does uh, caching, but also on-page optimization. Um, and it's constantly evolving. They recently changed how they do some JavaScript stuff. Um, it, it works pretty well out of the box, but you do have to enable a few more settings and, and test carefully to make sure it's actually optimizing all of those things. Um, uh, Sometimes we have to do a little bit of code, honestly, um, especially with cumulative layout shift. We might have to put a CSS spacer in there so that we've already predefined the space. Um, another thing that WP Rocket recently did was they have a um, image height and width fix. 
So if you happen to have some images that don't specify the image height and width in the code, the browser doesn't know how big it is. Uh, so it won't put any space there. And then when, the, when it actually loads the image, it, it expands the space. Well, WP Rocket can now um, basically add that to the code to say, okay, the image is gonna be this big. Um, that's not a huge problem on WordPress, um, especially in content, because normally when you insert an image, WordPress by default will put that, that in there, but that's one little tweak. Mm -hmm. um, um, one other thing, um, this is actually like breaking news as of like a day or two ago. Uh, for those of you who use Slickstream, which is that recommendation engine with the film strip at the top, uh, we've been working with Kingston and Carl there um, to help with the cumulative layout shift issues on that. Because what was happening was the page would load and then the, the um, film strip would load and it would push the content down. And so that triggered a whole big layout shift. So we, we were manually adding some style to put a spacer in for that bar, but now they've actually made it easier um, with the most recent update of their plugin. Um, if you use the Genesis theme or Genesis framework, so anybody using Foodie Pro or Brunch Pro, um, there's now a setting in the plugin um, to actually insert it and it'll manage the layout shift. So they're, they're you know, we've still got a few months and like all these tools, everybody's working to solve these problems right now. So that's another mm -hmm. example, I guess. And prepare. Well, there's, as if we didn't have enough new things or things to start working on, there's another, I guess I'd call it a fad. It's been around for a year now, but it's now getting really popular. And it's the web stories. So is this Google's version of like an Instagram reel or Instagram stories or what are web stories? And is it something that everyone needs to go jump on the bandwagon right now? <laughs> Well, uh, so web stories are basically like Instagram stories or Facebook stories where you've got a vertical pane that's the shape of a mobile phone screen um, mm -hmm. and it'll auto play, it'll auto advance between steps or you can tap and it'll jump forward, right? Um, personally, I hate them. I hated them on Instagram, I hated them on Facebook and I now <laughs> hate the Google web stories. Um, and the reason I hate them is because I think the usability is horrible. Um, mm -hmm. They're basically carousels from the early 2000s and like the usability has been dug bunks from that. So that's my soapbox. Um, that's my own <laughs> personal opinion. So that may be controversial, but um, I, I just think that the, the interface isn't great. Now, can mm -hmm. they be great? Maybe, um, you know, and I may be tilting it with Mills because if I'm going against Google, then Google's gonna win. Uh, but um, so basically uh, this is Google's implementation that allows publishers to publish their own version of Instagram stories or Facebook stories on their own website. Mm -hmm. So this is technically, it's actually just another web page. Um, it's built in AMP, but you don't really need to know that. Um, and, and it will step through those different pages like a slider. And you can view it on desktop as well. It, it kind of gives you like the, the thing and you can see on the side, the next slide's coming up. Um, and then within those pages or panes, you can add um, animation, you, you, know, you can add video, you can add uh, various things in there to create an engaging experience, hopefully. Mm -hmm. Okay. So is this something that you would recommend publishers start trying and see if it works for their for their users uh, and have a great experience with it, especially with the page experience algorithm. Or there's enough going on with preparing for May; it's not a top priority. <laughs> you know, I think it's worth testing. Um, we've had okay. a lot of clients testing it, and basically, what's happening right now it's still a land grab. It's the wild west, right? And a couple months yeah. ago, Casey started telling everybody to do it, and people started jumping on it, and and. Makes perfect sense, right? And, it, and it's been fantastic. I mean, and, we've had bloggers. I mean, I'm not kidding. I think Andrew and Ashley could both tell you on the call how much stuff I got sent to me during Christmas. <laughs> it was a ridiculous. little jealous. I a was little slightly jealous. Yeah. jealous. I got people sending me. I got a. I got hams. I had a woman who she'd never qualified for for. Uh, and I'm gonna. Andrew's gonna love this. But she literally could not build traffic. The most traffic she'd ever make from Google was 5,000 sessions in a month. She did one web story and got 25,000 recorded traffic. Wow. Just in that, just in a week from, and here's the best thing is that it's not going to help her much qualify for Mediavine, but she got a crap ton of email signups and she was able to convert that traffic other ways. Um, so that, that's yeah, the trick. So important. what we're seeing though is, uh, so here's what happens basically right now is you publish a web story. Yeah. Um, Yoast is, if you have Yoast SEO installed, it's smart enough to add your web stories to your mm -hmm. sitemap. Yep. That's all you need to do for Google to crawl it. Um, mm -hmm. And you, if, also, if you want to create a web story, you can use the, the Google Web Stories. That's what it's called, the Google Web Stories pub plugin for WordPress. Mm -hmm. um, Slickstream also has a web stories tool that they're rolling out, which is also very slick. Um, so 
what's happening right now is you publish some web stories and assuming you do a decent job and you make some actually good content in that web story. That's very important. That's very important. So you, you create a good web story um, and ignore my, my um, curmudgeonliness about this. Um, then what happens is Google Discover may pick it up and Google Discover is the feed that's in the Google app on phones. So anybody who's got an Android phone, there's the scroll below the Google uh, search box that basically is like recommended content. And so Google is basically testing, putting your web stories in there and that can generate a whole boatload of traffic. And that's what really is driving this. Um, you can see some of this in your Google search console. It'll show um, there, there should be a um, discover feed or discover set of stats. Um, what we're finding though, is um, most of our clients are coming back saying, I had a huge spike in traffic and then nothing. Mm -hmm. Um, so Very Google common. tested out for a while. So that's, so I guess I'm saying that as be prepared for that. Mm -hmm. And like Casey said, you know, set it up so you can, you can use that spike in traffic to your advantage, whether that's to get people to a post where there's an opt-in or something like that. Right. Um, so you're not going to earn a lot of money from the web stories themselves. It's sort of like the secondary effect where you can get this traffic and then figure out what to do with it. Right. And, and to that extreme, you know, to, to that effect, let's add a little bit onto that. Uh, Mediavine, again, they're very quick to jump on the web stories bandwagon. They launched a plugin to allow you to monetize your web stories. If you're with Mediavine, it's pennies on the dollar, but it's something a lot of people are frustrated. They'll do one web story. It'll do well. They'll do another web story. It won't get picked up or it won't do well. And, and, they're confused. Well, I will tell you guys that a lot of the web stories I've been seeing lately are complete and utter garbage. And when we talk about web stories, we really have to really think about this is a land rush. There is a lot of competition. If you're publishing a web story that has four frames, that's probably not going to do it. If you're publishing a web story where you even forgot to put the name of your site on your cover image, that's not going to do it. If you're publishing a web story where it's literally just a link one photo, and then here's a link to the recipe, and then maybe you've got another final slide where it's just a link to your site. That's not going to do it. And a couple other things to be aware of is that you really want to be careful on the speed of the frames. Mm -hmm. Not kidding. Had a blogger the other day come, and she says, I've done three of these web stories, and none of them have taken off. When I looked at them, she was way too fast, way too fast. It was they were the frames were going boom, 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 boom. All we did was slow the frames down, and boom. Story got indexed within the next couple hours, and she was very pleased with what she was generating from that. I know Tammy and others have have asked, why do some web stories take off and others don't? I think that, again, it's a bottom line quality issue. It's also the fact that, you know, not every web story that you're going to write is going to be perfect or is going to connect with users. And it is what it is. I would just say that you should try to use these web stories when they're appropriate. Um, I believe that web stories are a great example of what's called just-in-time content. Valentine's Day is coming up. If I was you and I had Valentine's Day content, I would be pushing out web stories around Valentine's Day like I didn't have anything else to do. Yeah. Okay. And so, then I would understand that that content is going to die relatively quickly, but that's the whole point. It's a just in time content. I, I think it's also helpful to think about web stories in two ways right now. Uh, one is as an advertisement for your blog, like we were just talking about, where you're trying to get into the Discover feed and entice somebody to, you know, you're going to do like a preview basically of your recipe or your post, and you're enticing somebody to click through to the full post. Mm -hmm. um, and in something like that, you want to make it a really good teaser where you have this most drool worthy photos and some calls to action, like click here for the full recipe, stuff like that. Um, another way we're seeing web stories used is actually more like an interactive video. Um, Pinch of Yum is doing oh. a great job with this. Um, and I'm going to send a link here of an example. If you go to her uh, so squash salad with kale recipe, um, if you scroll down, it takes a second to load, but there's a lead photo and a couple paragraphs. And then she's embedded a web story in the blog post. And it's not an advertisement to go to the post. She's using it like a how-to video. So you've got like 10 different panes and each pane is a different step in the video. So she's using that as an interactive way to walk you through the video which is a lot easier to use than a video. So I will definitely give it that, right? You don't have to like play and pause, you can step back. So you've sort of got like these bookmarks and each video is separate in there and she's got um, captions on there. Um, so I think this is, to me, this is much more interesting because you're, you're using this or she's using this in a way that actually enhances the visitor's experience. And so I think there's some benefit in that. Um, in, oh, go ahead. Sorry. I just saw, I just saw um, Sylvia's question about embedding stories in the blog post slowing down your site. Um, there is definitely concerns with speed and bandwidth. Um, so I do want to mention that actually. Um, uh, 
the Google Web Stories plugin, right now at least, uh, forces you to upload any videos to your own media library and serve it from your site. So that can start using a lot of bandwidth if you get a huge spike in traffic. Um, we've been asking them to make it possible to do third party hosted. So it'd be much better if like Mediavine could be hosting the videos, for example. Mm -hmm. um, so you do wanna be careful that it doesn't slow things down um, or use too much bandwidth. But if you like embed it in a post that should load asynchronously, um, and then you know everything else should load and that should pop into place afterwards. You wanna make sure you don't get a cumulative layout shift or a layout shift from it, but um, uh, so it is something to pay attention to right now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And at, at the end of the day, all of this information is for publishers. And at the end of the day, what publishers do best is create content. So Andrew, as we're in Q1, we're about to wrap up the first month of Q1 what content priorities should publishers really focus on when we know May is coming with a big update, um, with the big update that happened in December, getting back to basics with content, where should the focus be in Q1? You know, I think my advice would be the same as it is every year. Um, think about what's coming up seasonally, start looking at that content and republishing, um, sprucing it up, you know, uh, maybe creating web stories for that content, right? Like mm -hmm. Casey was just talking about Valentine's Day. Um, who knows what the heck is going to happen with the Super Bowl this year and how that's going <laughs> to land with, but like Super Bowl recipes are always huge, right? Um, or Cinco de Mayo recipes and all that stuff. So um, as always, you want to be thinking about um, what's coming up and republishing. Um, you know, if, if you're someone who's just starting out, you're writing new content for that. If you're someone who's got five or 600 posts already, you've probably already got the content. You don't necessarily need to add more content. You're probably better off repurposing and, and, and sprucing things up. Um, in terms of the stuff that's coming up, um, uh, oh, well, let's see, your question was really about uh, content because I'm thinking technical stuff right now, but- um, <laughs> you, have you have the know, technical mindset always. <laughs> always, <laughs> that's why I stopped writing my food blog. Uh, <laughs> um, so, yeah, I mean, make sure your content's good. That's, you know, the bottom line of SEO is make sure your content's good and your technical yeah. stuff is done correctly. Like you do those things and you're in good shape. Um, and so web stories are just content, you know, recipes are content, um, mm -hmm. give people what they want. And, um, you know, I think one other thing that's a really good exercise, and I've said this before, is look at your site on your mobile phone. Um, you know, we all work on our desktops, right? When we're creating this content. Um, I'm working on three screens right now. And when I pick up a phone and look at a, a blog and it's overrun with ads and I can't even read the content, there's a problem, right? Yeah. So I think it, it's good to do just a quick reality check. You know, this mm -hmm. doesn't have to be super- Let's talk common. about that really quick because we've had a couple of questions yeah. on aggressive ad practices. Yeah. When you hear colleagues like my colleague, Glenn Gabe over at I'm, I, IQ Interactive and, and other places who Marie Haynes, Marie Hayes Consulting, who they, along with myself, have access to literally hundreds of sites in various niches. And whenever we are talking about ad aggressive practices, we're talking about things that are not the norm. You have auto playing video ads that follow you down the screen. Now, most of you on the call are with Mediavine and AdThrive. I'm not kidding. They have rogue ads all the time. I can't tell you how many times I'm on the call and I see an auto playing ad with sound. That's a no no. So we always want to be vigilant about that. You should be testing your content regularly. Now I will tell you that some of the other ad networks are much worse. No reason to throw anyone under the bus, but you know who they are if I haven't said media on an ad drive. And they're very bad about, you know, a lot of this being very aggressive. You should not be running any above the fold leaderboard ads at all, period. You shouldn't run them with sheet media. You shouldn't run them with ad drive. You shouldn't run them with anyone. You should also not be running any leaderboard, any skyscraper ads on your sidebar that pushes below the fold, your actual about me photo and, and indexable content. You shouldn't be running any ads that pop in between your title and the first indexable content on the page on desktop. And that includes mobile as well. And honestly, you need to start dialing back the affiliate links, especially if you're stuffing your recipe cards, not only with affiliate links, but affiliate product links. Those Amazon affiliate product links are so slow. It's like watching me run a mile. Okay. No <laughs> one wants to do that. Okay. You don't want to do that. You want to remove those product links, those Amazon product links specifically. You are never going to make enough from your ad card, ad card to justify the, the just terrible in the toilet metrics you're going to put up on the paid speed tools. And I was talking to a blogger today. She just onboarded for a full audit in June and same issue completely create ads or just completely stuffed with all these Amazon product ads or these, you know, I, I'm not even sure it's Amazon product ads. I think there's just a way for you to put in actual product ads 
from MediaVine, not a fan of those at all. Okay, less is more with ads. I want you to monetize. I'd rather triple your traffic and have you run less ads and make twice as much money. That's my bottom line. That's why I think the audits have been so successful. That's always been my approach. Mm -hmm. And that makes sense. All right, we are about to head to Q&A. There's tons of questions in there. So thank you everybody for putting your questions in there. If you have a question that you want to ask the panelists and haven't yet, head on over to the Q&A box and definitely drop it in there. We're not gonna be able to hit all of them, but after the panelists review all the questions and they do address every single one and then we publish them in the recap. So you do get your question answered, whether or not it's here or later on the blog post. But uh, Casey, Andrew, I have one last question for both of you. Um, Casey, if you wanna go first. Wrapping things up with all of these updates, the new content types, the optimization, the user experience, what are three things? If, if a publisher was only going to focus on three things, what would you recommend they focus on this first quarter fixing? I would immediately go into your Google Analytics and I would make a list of everything that was doing extremely well in the first quarter of 2020. And I would look at that at content right now and see if there's anything that we can update and republish based upon all the lessons you've learned, hopefully from this webinar and all the previous SEO for Publisher webinars, and let's refeature that content. Now, previously, you've heard me many times recommend the talk about the difference between updated and republishing content. Well, if you're making substantial changes, I'm always all about republishing content, okay? We, we clone the post, we make a ton of changes, we update the modified in the last published date, boom, we hit Google, we hit our RSS feed, we hit the homepage with all that new content at the same time. Now, unfortunately, we've had a ton of issues with revisionize and revision, and revision manager TMC. Here's the thing, Yoast just introduced a new plugin called the Yoast Duplicate Post Plugin. I've recommended it for the last two weeks. I've got three emails, testimonies from bloggers who are telling me that it works very well. So. I can tell you that that is something that you might want to look into. It's called the Yoast Duplicate Post Plugin. It does everything that these previous plugins did, but it clearly is maintained. And that plugin will allow us to clone a post, make all the changes, recombine the cloned post with the original post at the same URL and have that go live uh, at a date of your choosing. And that's what we want to do. Oh, I'm sorry, I only, I only took one, right? So we've got the republish the content in analytics. Number two, I would be looking, focusing specifically on those core web vitals. Can we get that stuff improved? Seek out help. Um, many of you might be on block support plans and I can tell you that Andrew loves to receive your emails about core web vitals. He tells me that it, it soothes him like a baby at night. It's like a warm hug oh, to yeah. receive all these emails about core web vitals. Uh, maybe you're signed up with Grayson Bell over at iMark Interactive. He has done a lot of research. He's actually been able to make some very good gains on clients that I've sent over. Maybe you're with Charles Smith over at WP Opt. Contact him. See, show him here's all my errors that I'm getting in my search console. We need really need to fix this stuff. See what he can do for you. But seek out help. If you're confused by it, seek out help. Contact us for recommendations, but we need to get these core web vitals taken care of before May. And then number three is I really want you to just passionately look at your site on a, on a mobile device, on a, on a desktop device. Look at it. Have your relatives look at it. Are they complaining about the ads? Are they complaining about the, an, a lower or less optimized user viewing experience on these, on these screens? What can we do to improve our overall experience? Focus on that. UX is a big deal. And improving UX is going to lead to a lot of other uh, benefits down the road. Amazing. You touched on content optimization and user experience and all three I know. of your tips. So all coming up Andrew, in my book. Can you follow us up with three more? No, no, just what, what Casey said. We're good. What Casey said yeah. times two. Andrew needs <laughs> to say ditto. Ditto. Uh, I, 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 I I, well, okay. Instead of three specific things, I do have a couple of little details that I have in my notes that I just want to run through to make sure we touch on them, actually. Um, um, first, uh, talk to your ad network about core web vitals. So that's one of the things you need to do. Um, if you're with Mediavine, they recommend um, using the PSAs, the public service announcements. You can actually, you don't even have to talk to them, just log into your Mediavine dashboard and turn on the PSAs that you like. They I'll have like eight or different uh, topics. Um, so you don't have to support all of the things or you can turn up. Um, 
Um, you can pick just one. Um, and those, what those do is serve non-paying ads, they're public service announcements, um, only if there isn't a, another paying ad to serve. So they won't hurt your revenue. Mm -hmm. um, basically, you'll get a public service announcement instead of a blank space. Um, and what that does is it gives you an ad in that spot instead of collapsing it, which helps with your cumulative layout shift. Um, and you're doing some good for the world. So um, for those of you on Mediavine, opt into their PSAs. Um, I don't think AdThrive has that yet. Um, but you I don't can, think so. Yeah, and they do have some tweaks they can make to the styling, though, to help mm -hmm. solve the CLS issues. So if you're with Ad, Ad Thrive, reach out to them directly and, and be like, hey, guys, fix my CLS. CLS. Um, and they may blame some other things, but at least make sure that on the ads, they're doing what they need to do. Um, one other thing where we see a lot of layout shift issues is with web fonts. Um, so this is like Google fonts where you load your site and it shows one font and then it flashes in with your fancy font. Well, if the, the preload font that's displayed first doesn't match the size of the web font, like the spacing's different or the characters are different, you can get a shift, especially if something wraps to another line. Like if something's wider and it goes to two lines and then it jumps up. Um, and you can sometimes see this in the Google PageSpeed Insights film strip where it shows screenshots. Um, web page test actually has a better and easier to see tool on that. Um, but this might be the year to kill your web fonts and just use safe fonts. Um, there's a technique, a technique now called a system font stack, which basically uses the native fonts for whatever browser somebody's on. So if you're on Windows, it'll use the Windows friendly fonts. If you're on Mac, it'll use the Mac friendly fonts. So it's not like one of those three fonts anymore. Um, nice thing is it, the font's already loaded, so it's much faster. And it actually looks a little bit more natural to the user because it's more, it, it's the same font as like all the other stuff in the app or in the, in the device. So it looks a little more native. Um, so um, switching the system font stacks is not necessarily a trivial project because um, you may need to redesign a bunch of stuff in your styling. Um, I know uh, for those of you uh, using Trellis or looking to use Trellis, that's actually their default now. We pushed for that, which is great. Um, uh, yeah. Um, also, two other things that uh, just came out this week from WP Recipe Maker, which I think are really neat. Um, um, you can now uh, have it show the recipe's carbon footprint. And there's a don't go to sleep mode you can turn on. Um, not all devices support it, so it's still a little experimental, but I think that's a really neat feature for someone who's cooking a recipe, you know, on their phone or their tablet to, ha to have a toggle in the recipe card that says, keep my device awake so it doesn't constantly keep shutting off while your hands are greasy and you're tapping it. I think that's a neat little feature. So I'm excited. That is amazing. I can't right? tell you how many times I've gotten <laughs> flour all over my phone because it goes to sleep and I have to turn it on and enter my passcode. Right. And and that's the kind of stuff I think that really endears visitors. When you have when you when you're thinking of their experience like that and you're thinking ahead and making your site easier to use, they're gonna want to come back and use your site again, right? Um yeah, okay. I think that was that was my my extra little thing. The only, the only, yeah, the, and again, very fantastic points. And again, I know CLS is going to be troublesome for a lot of you on the call. I know that WP Rocket is trying to help you with that. They did introduce a new feature where you can go in and enable, it's a checkbox to enable image dimensions. Basically it allows the plugin to kind of do some of the heavy lifting behind the scenes and specify image dimensions for you to stop some of the shifting from happen. Now, Andrew will know better than me, but I'm not sure that it's been super effective in any way that I've tested it, but it certainly is a, a setting you can play around with. And ultimately with the, the layout shifts, you have to know what's shifting, right? Before you mm -hmm. can. Oh, and on that, yeah. Something yeah. that's actually moving as the page loads. So web page test is probably the best tool. You, yep. can, um, you can, when you run a test on webpagetest.org, you can set film strip view, uh -huh. and then you can actually create a video from it, and you can have it play back in slow motion. It's actually painfully slow, but you literally watch your page load very slowly, like mm -hmm. at content speed, and you see things pop in, yep. and then you can see the thing shift. And so you go, oh, okay, this is what shifted. Now how do I fix it? Um, and that may be an easy fix, it may be a hard fix, but at least you know what you're trying to exactly. do. Exactly, very, very good point. Interesting, very interesting. So we have 25 questions. We're definitely not gonna be able to get to all of them because we are officially <laughs> over time, but I wanna squeeze in just a couple quick questions about web stories because there's so many of them. And don't forget, there's gonna be a recap. This is all gonna go onto a blog post. All these questions will eventually get answered. But a uh, question from anonymous attendee, the default length for each web story slide is seven seconds. Is it a good idea to make it shorter? What would you guys recommend? Is seven seconds the safe? I bet? think so. No, I think seven seconds is a little long. Um, as a matter of fact, we 
we lowered it. I cut it in half. And that's why one of the stories I was talking to Andrew about it today, I cut it down to three on one and it literally got picked up very quickly. Now, again, it could have just been that, that story, but depending upon all the information you're included on the slide, seven seconds is a long time. So no, I don't, I didn't, I didn't know that that was the default. I didn't think that was the default. Maybe that's recently, but it shouldn't be. That's way too long. Okay. Way too long. And then another question about web stories from Ginny is what is the best way to make web stories? Do you, are you guys aware of any tools that kind of put them together or like is there Canva templates for them? Yeah, there are plenty here. I mean, Andrew might know them. You can get make stories, which is another plugin. You can use the, the again, the Google web stories format there. Um, it seems like every time we, we visit Andrew, they've updated the plugin. So I suspect that if you just hold on, they're going to add more, more and new templates to that specifically. I mean, I, I think the logistically, the Google web stories plugin, at least in theory is really good because you insert it, you know, you build it all in your dashboard and it's all there. Um, but I've heard a lot of people complaining about the usability of the interface to create the actual stories. Um, I, for those of you using Slickstream, I definitely recommend talking to Kingston and Carl and checking out their Slickstream builder. Um, I think you can take jump ropes and convert them, maybe. Um, I haven't actually built a web story because I'm not publishing new content right now. So I, I'd have to check with my team with Carrie and Ben and see what, what their favorite tools are these days. Um, but you know, ultimately, I think it's less about the tool you use um, and more that you're creating good content. So you may need to try a few tools to see which you like personally to build in and which is easy and intuitive for you, just like any other content creation. Mm -hmm. And the final question to wrap everything up, is it worthwhile to unpublish a just-in-time web story and then republish it next year? That's a good question. And I would say no. And the reason I would say no is that when we went unpublish something, we are creating a 404 to something that's already indexed especially if it's done this for a long time, that could be a low quality signal to Google. I would just leave it and we'll come back to it. Maybe we could refeature it. We can refeature it in the future. Uh, you could, you know, refresh the sitemap on that. You could go ahead and provide some new links to it, get it to pop back in for consideration. But no, I don't think it's a little bit too soon to worry about no indexing these web stories or definitely unpublishing them. I don't, I don't think we should ever unpublish anything. Uh, that's just a temporary 404 which long-term could hurt bottom line quality on that specific page. Perfect, all right. Well, Casey, Andrew, thank you so much for everything that you shared today. This was absolutely amazing. Attendees, I know we went over a lot of stuff, but don't worry, you will have the replay. We'll be sending out an email next week with all of this information for you guys to read the rest of the questions and answers, as well as rewatch this as you need to. Um, next month, we're going to be having the next episode on February 24th, so you'll also get an email. Everyone who registered will get an email with those details, but thank you both panelists and everyone who joined us today from all over the world. Thank you so much for joining and take care, everyone. Bye, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.